All right, so for the most part, I think we've done everything we can to match the anatomy, the lighting. We're playing with texture here. That's what we did last time. Uh, sometimes with your texture, it helps to bring everything together. For those of you kind of unhappy with how, how flat and how bright and how sharp everything looks, I highly recommend texture overlays and playing with those, right? But you can always internally composite texture as well. So I can take this texture overlay, this kind of greenish mist, take a chunk of it, duplicate it, bring it down, because I don't think the legs are kind of, um, I think they're too strong. Then I can actually up the opacity of that, of that mist on the legs, and then I can erase away from it, like so. So you have all the control in the world. with these pixels and it's just kind of recognizing the potential they have that's what this proving grounds all about and then you can even do little things like I'm gonna move these mount this these rocks down a little bit because I did all this work to make the the legs appear underwater so I can just move those down just a little bit out of the way to kind of showcase some of that. Show some more of the reflections, even some of the sky showing there. All right. And if that sky just looks really boring to me, just do a quick reminder of how a texture overlay looks. I can go to Pixabay, and maybe I want like a bright, sunny sky. So let me say bright, sunny See what I get. Look at those beautiful clouds. I'm gonna open that up. I'm gonna download it. I don't even need full resolution. It's gonna to go to my downloads folder. I'm gonna put it into my proving ground folder and then drag it into my image, right? So this is a texture overlay. I'm gonna put those clouds up in the sky. How can I do that? I just decide where they need to be. Whoops. Option command T. Go to my background layer. Use magic wand, select all of that sky. And then move that selection onto my texture overlay and just duplicate it, right? And now I can play just like I do with any texture overlays with the opacity of it, how much comes through. In fact, I like that so much that I actually might want some of this brightness to come through that opening. So I'm gonna rasterize it and then erase away those hard edges at 100% opacity. and let that light kind of come in through that opening, right? So these kind of texture overlays can really help to, to sync things back, make things more believable. And they just kind of blur with everything. And because they're soft, I can always option command T and just grow them more and more. And then I can always just erase out at lower opacities. So that's, that's how uh, helpful these texture overlays can be to get everything to match. Okay. Nice. So now that we have it, 
we want to acknowledge and identify the patterns of what we have. So I'm going to save it. Remember, I'm always saving it with a new name, with my name improving ground one. I call these a creature scrape. It's not assignment one. You don't want to accidentally overwrite it. So I'm going to save it to the desktop. It's right there. So I know where it is. I'm going to mark that green. Then I'm going to say file export as a JPEG. Because I don't need any transparency here. It's filling a rectangle. And I'm going to save that. And that's going to go to downloads. Then I'm going to move it out from downloads onto the desktop and mark it orange. That's what goes into Canvas. While it's still open, I'm going to do one more thing because this is a requirement of the proving ground. <laughs> the jackets are big and in the way. So I am going to go to image, image size. And I am going to uncheck this box for resample. So this is important for understanding what pixels you have and you're required to put them in this assignment. So I'm going to uncheck resample. What that does is that will keep the pixels exactly as they are, but it will allow me to express them at different physical formats. So I want a, a physical format that's larger than 8 by 10. So I'm going to first try out standard print resolution, which is 300 pixels per inch. Then click off. So at 300 pixels per inch, this is 12 inches by 10.68 inches. I'm going to do a quick screen grab of that. Just so I remember. And I'm going to write that into my post. And there it is. I'm going to put it into my folder. Okay. What if at 300 it wasn't 8 by 10? What if it was smaller than 8 by 10? So I'm going to resample here. I don't recommend this. <laughs> I don't want you to do this. I'm going to make this 7 instead. And so this is 7.8 by 7 at 300. Because it's not larger than 8 by 10 at 300, when I uncheck resample, which keeps the pixels wh where they are, I can no longer say that this is standard print resolution because I need it to be larger than 8 by 10 if it's going to be print resolution. So I change it to 72 pixels per inch. Now the image is 50, 50 inches by 44 inches, but it's still at screen resolution because it's 72 pixels per inch. And that's because when it's at 300, it's not quite 8 by 10 yet. It is in this case, but don't worry about that. All right. So you need to know what your pixel dimensions are, and then you need to be able to identify whether that's good enough for screen or good enough for print resolution. Print resolution is 300 pixels per inch. Screen resolution is 72 pixels per inch. To put it another way, let me show you what we did in the morning class. Because I actually posted it two different ways, but that takes a lot of time. Because <clears throat> it depends on how you crop it, right? So in this first example, I put the creature up in the sky into this small corner of my landscape. And because that was smaller, I cropped down because you want the creature to be at least 20%, right? And then when I checked its image size, this only was big enough for screen resolution at 72 pixels per inch. And that was 30 inches by 23 inches. That's a mighty big TV right there at 72 pixels per inch. Right? Now on this one, it was big enough to do 20 inches by 13 inches at 300 pixels per inch. That's standard print resolution. So let me show you when we post this now. We go into our class. And we're posting it. We need to post three things. The first thing we post, well, we always post our name. And then we post our JPEG image. and then make it kind of fit well with our name, right? Okay, next, we need to post what it asks for here. 
the resolution in pixels per inch and the physical format print size. So I could do this a few ways. I could actually post my screen grab, which shows it, but then I have to identify what that means. This is large enough for standard print resolution. Or what you'll see in all of the examples is that you just write the physical format size. And that is, you always do width first. I'm going to round here 12 inches by 10.7 inches at 300 pixels per inch. And then say, this is large enough for standard print resolution. To meet this first rubric, you have to do both of those things. You have to give the, uh, the physical format in PPI, the inches in the PPI, and you have to name it, whether that's good enough for print size or for screen. Those are the two types. Okay, the next and the third thing we have to do, because this shows that I match the anatomy and the lighting, this shows that I've understood the resolution and the physical format correctly. The third is I want to explain how my creature is intended to interact with its environment. Because in problem solving, you don't always understand connections between things until you have to articulate them. So I gave my creature a name. I called it a cavern mud skipper. So I'm just going to start typing the cavern mud skipper lives in shallow grottos in temperate climates. It feeds on salamanders and various insects. It's, let's see, glistening wings. This is not a creative writing class, but you're just, you're looking at the creature, you're looking at the environment, and you're trying to figure out ways they interact with each other. Its glistening wings do not allow for flight, but help to fan the sulfurous fumes from such subterranean, it's okay if you don't spell things correctly, environments. <coughs> I love Grammarly. All right. So what have I not addressed? The cavern mudskipper lives in shallow grottos and temperate climates. It feeds on salamanders and various insects. Its glistening wings do not allow for flight, but help to fan the sulfurous fumes from fumes that are present in such subterranean environments. Its large eyes allow for uh, for sight even at the darkest depths. And its powerful legs help it to traverse its powerful legs and webbed feet help it to traverse the slick terrain. All right, I think that's enough. <laughs> so you're just making connections between the creature and its environment. I didn't say anything about how it camouflages or, but 